Hey folks, we're going to get started in just one moment. I want to give people the opportunity to join us and come on in. So come on in and we will be starting in just one moment. So hi, for everyone who doesn't know me, my name is Bobby Carlton. I am the founder of Innovation Women and the editor-in-chief of Lioness Magazine. So welcome to today's Lioness Community event. So Lioness, if you are unfamiliar with our magazine, is your source for everything you need to know to start and run your company. We've got guides, we've got resources, we've got interviews, we've got how-tos, and we also have some fantastic inspirational stories to kind of give you the information you need and also the inspiration you need. And we'd like to give you a little gift today. If you are interested in subscribing to Lioness Magazine, we're going to drop a special link. You can see it on the screen into the chat, and you can sign up for an annual for subscription for just $12. So check it out. Lots of good stuff for you at Lioness Magazine. And also, we're going to share a link to our next community event, this will be a networking event. So this is your opportunity to meet up with other female entrepreneurs and trade stories, trade connections, and get acquainted with folks. So we will be doing another Lioness networking session on May 2nd at noon, and the link is in the chat. So... Without further ado, I would like to welcome everybody and introduce Nicole. So we're going to stop that screen share and uh, say hello to Nicole today. Hi, Nicole. Thanks Hi, for Bob. joining us. It is my pleasure. I love being here. And Nicole founded Socialite in 2009 to help make the internet a friendlier place by providing the tools and training small business owners need for success online. Through Socialite, Nicole helps clients hone their digital exposure to their brand while boosting the bottom line. So Nicole is going to be taking it away today. Well, thank you so much for having me and for joining. And we are, in fact, here to talk about boosting your bottom line. And we're going to talk about sales outreach and how to get success on that, specifically using LinkedIn, because we can all use a little boost from that. Um, I also Actually, I'm going to stop Nicole for just one second. Oh, okay. And she's got the display setting set so that we are seeing... Uh, the preview. <laughs> oh, goodness. I shared the wrong. Screen. That is, Let's that is quite all right. That happens. This one. How's that one working? There out? we go. And oh, we're off again. Technology. Here we go. Okay. So thank you for that. Uh, but let, let's jump in and talk about the fact that for a lot of people, sales can be scary. And one of that re one of the reasons is that it is a numbers game, meaning you have to put yourself out there quite a bit to actually get one sales. So the numbers that I have on the screen are general averages based on kind of all kinds of different sales campaigns. The, the consistent thing is cold outreach. Now, cold outreach, this is the equivalent of the cold call, the phone calls that you used to get at dinner. You may still get a few of those, but these days with all the electronics, it can happen over LinkedIn, it can happen over email. I'm sure you get a slew of things every day. And the thing is, is that most of us don't actually react to these. So I'm going to put these numbers in context a bit by giving you a sale of what it actually looks like if you were to do things on a thousand people. Now, start out with a thousand people that you are targeting and right off the bat, you are going to lose seven to eight hundred of them because they're never even going to open your email. That's kind of scary because as we go forward, everything drops off. Your click-through rate, you're only getting 50 to 100 people, much less the number of people that are going to actually reply to you. Now, here's the one that is really touchy for me, this idea of a qualification rate. 
Now, what it means to qualify your leads is that you need to know that somebody is interested and can actually use your products or services, that they have the money to pay you for said products and services, and that there is actually the right timing for them. That is hard to do based on cold outreach. And so for before we're even really even having any sales conversations, we've dropped from a thousand people down to 10 to 20 being our prospect list. And we're going to drop all the way down to all less than 1% of people are going to make a sale. That is not exciting. And the worst thing about it is that based on these averages, you would need to reach out to 2,500 people to get one sale. Now, before you say Psh, sales is not for me, I'm done with this webinar, thank you very much. Let me come to the point that a lot of sales efforts are not done well. And in fact, I'm going to point out three specific things that make sales fail. First and foremost, this bad targeting. I'm actually going to make the argument that we go back to this qualification rate, then instead of sending to thousands of people and only ending up with 10 to 20 qualified people, we might consider actually putting some work in to qualify our leads first before we waste all the time to outreach. Because quite frankly, how are you going to find 2,500 people all the time to make sales? That is a lot of effort. And so instead, I'm going to say we want to make some effort to qualify our leads first. I'm going to give you a three-step program to do that. And the first one is to determine what you're selling. And if your internal dialogue says, I'm selling my services, come on, Nicole. I get that. But here's the thing. At Socialite, we have about five core services. We have a bunch of different projects. And so I have clients that range from very solopreneurs that need some basic web supports to associations that are paying me to digitize their annual reports every year. Those are vastly different customers, right? And so what they need and how I'm going to talk to them is very different. So when you're doing this type of sales effort, I'm going to suggest that you pick one thing that you sell, and I'm also going to suggest that it is the easiest thing to get people on, on board for. What is the common denier? I say the bright, shiny object. For a, a lot of my clients, they come in because they need social media support, because they feel like they should do it, they know they do it, but they don't have the time or the inclination to do that. So that, um, that type of effort is a lot easier sell than a several thousand dollar website design project, right? So when you are thinking about these sales objects or these sales efforts, think about what is your easiest entree into the business and perhaps people can grow up with you as they prove your value, but think about what that specific thing you're selling and then think through who is buying. I'm gonna tell you that one of the good things that you can do is think about the common denominators of your clients. And again, the client selling, buying that particular service. So I'm gonna think about solopreneurs, not the big association clients. That's who I wanna focus on to bring things through. If you are rolling out a new project or you want to do sales because you don't have enough clients to develop a basis, that's okay. Uh, that's where we get into something called coming up with a persona. Now, you may have heard about this and some people go really deep into this, but the idea is you create a picture in your mind, almost a character of who you want to sell for. So I might say, I want to sell to this woman named Joyce, who is a therapist. She's 45 years old. She spent 20 years in a corporate practice, and now she's ready to go out on her own. So she really knows her therapy. She knows what he's do she's doing, but leading a business and all the things like a website, marketing, all that type of stuff is new for her. So she might very well benefit from the type of support I'm offering. Now that's pretty detailed. You may not go in that detail and that's okay, but you can at least come through the common elements. And once you do, you are going to go into sale, LinkedIn Sales Navigator to help create the, uh, this profile of who you're talking about.
Now, LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a premium service. It's part of their plans. And so if you're saying to yourself, do I have to do that? No, you don't. The techniques that I'm going to talk about, you can do anytime. Um, you can do it via email. You can do it via LinkedIn, without a list, whatever it is. The reason that we use Sales Navigator is because they have all of these different filters. So I can filter on things like company headcount. I can look for people that are only solopreneurs. I can look for people with under 25 employees on their team. Um, I can look at how long the company has been in business, as well as how long an individual person has been in careers. So the value of LinkedIn Sales Navigator is this type of information is really hard to find if you're just searching through LinkedIn. It's going to take a lot more time to really have to go through individual profiles and figure out who you want to target. LinkedIn Sales Nav Navigator is going to sell you some time in helping you gather those leads. And they have a free month that's available to it. So it's worth taking advantage of that free month, trying it out and seeing if it's even if this effort makes a difference and is worth paying for. So um, as we use this type of thing and, and concentrate on this, we also want to go back to qualify our leads and make sure that they are still a match. Here's an example. Um, maybe I didn't go quite as, as deep in my targeting, but I told LinkedIn that I wanted solopreneurs that have been in business for one year, right? So that's a very broad target. It will give me a lot of people, but chances are there are web developers in there. There are other marketers. There are IT folks, essentially people that are very familiar with different types of technology. So they don't need the type of support factor this package that I'm trying to offer them. So if I take the moment to make sure somebody on the list link it, LinkedIn gives me is a match, it's going to save me time and it's not going to waste anybody else's time. So yes, this takes a bit more time than just saying, hey, LinkedIn, give me a list or buying some kind of list of 100 people. But the chances are the targets you're going to end up with are much more qualified and are going to give you better results for your sales efforts. Now, the next reason that most efforts fail is the approach. This is the message, how you how people will reach out to you and try to sell you things, or conversely, how you will try and sell things to other people. Now, if you recall that we had a lot of initial drop off on the initial messages without getting any replies, and that is because a lot of sales messages are very cut and dry. Now, I will tell you, I actually really appreciate when I get messages like this through LinkedIn because I can very safely click that ignore button without worrying about it. This gal, nice as she probably is, is she's not beating around the bush. She's not trying to establish a relationship. She's just trying to sell me something. It's not something that I'm interested in. And so I can click ignore and go on my way. This guy is a little bit different. I get messages like this fairly often. And, you know, this whole idea of I'm expanding my network and I'm passionate. Okay, that's really nice. But what's in it for me? What are you actually passionate about? And what is the idea of you expanding your network? How is that bringing value to me? There's not much in there. And so because we're all busy, uh, we probably don't have time to click around and say, OK, what's on this profile and, and, and is it worthwhile? Because it's so kind of wishy-washy, it doesn't do anything for me. So I'm not going to exactly discard them right away, but I'm not excited about making the connection and having more of a relationship. Now, that's on LinkedIn. I also want to mention email as well, because um, you may not be a marketing geek that studies subject lines the way I do. Uh, but if you look at some of the things that's been collecting in my spam box for over the last few days, you can see there's a lot of different consistencies in here. Things like, did you get my last email? Or quick question. Um, those are have become big triggers for me to say this is spam or a sales message, or which you know sometimes equates to more or less the right thing, the same thing. Because I'm not going to say I've never sent a friend a note that says, "Hey, quick question." But if that subject line is coming from somebody I don't know, then I really probably don't care about that email. I also want to point out that if you have been taking webinars or if you've been trying to get better about your email marketing campaigns, 
you might have been given the advice of customizing and personalizing your emails and subject lines. And to many people, what that means is they stick my name or my company name in the subject line of that, and that's personalizing things. And that makes it more interesting to me. Again, that has become a red flag for me that this is spam and it's not something I really need to pay attention to. So I bring this up not to do a huge study in subject lines, but because I want you, when you are thinking about doing sales efforts, I want you to think about the things that either cause you to engage or cause you to ignore something because you don't want to just take a tip to personalize your email and do things that are actually going to end up shooting you in the foot. So look at your own tweet ticks, if you will, your own pet peeves, and make sure you're not doing that. Because if it irritates you, it's going to irritate somebody else. Now, let's go on a little bit. Let's say I did actually open the message. And here again, we have this personalization. There are is plenty of advice that says you should find something on a website and, and compliment it and say how nice it is as a way to build a relationship and trust. And so this person tried to do it and it says your publication on five things to know about drip campaigns is so insightful. Great job um, presenting those details in an orderly manner. Are you looking for sales-based commission reps? And I'm like, what? That, that's such a weird left turn that it doesn't make sense to me. And I, I've lost the train of things because what really probably happened with this guy is he ran over my website, grabbed a random blog post, stuck it on his, his standard email and sit, sit, hit send. And so it's not smooth, it's choppy, and it just feels weird. Now, I'm not going to encourage you to do this or really almost any types of personalization. And the reason why is even had this guy taken time to read the post, to integrate it and send me a note that says, oh, your effort on drip campaigns means you obviously understand sales, but you know maybe you don't have the time to do it all and I could help with that. That's actually a nice message. However, it does not mean I'm going to be any more inclined to buy from this guy than I was earlier. And so I'm not going to tell you to waste the time to do that type of personalization. Instead, my advice is to think about messaging that is general enough that it can apply to most people, but it still focuses on your message. And that's where we start flipping from what not to do into things that you should do. And with sales, with marketing campaigns, whatever it is, you always need to make the message about your prospect. This is not about you. This is not all the wonderful things that you can do and your achievements. Well, because at the end of the day, most people don't actually care about you until they know that there's a benefit to them. Once they figure out you can help them, then they'll pay attention. But so one of the great things that you can do when you're thinking about messaging is focusing on a pain point. Now, let me be clear about what I mean by a pain point. A pain point is not my website isn't working and I need digital marketing. That's a need. But what a pain point is, is the conversations that I hear from my clients all the time that say, oh, I spent seven hours on Google and I was trying to figure out how to integrate this form for MailChimp and on my website and it was so frustrating and I couldn't work and I wasted this whole day. That is pain point, right? So if I can talk to the fact that this type of thing happens to you and I can make it stop for an inexpensive plan, that is something that is actually starting to show value. And that is what you want to do, especially on LinkedIn. You want to showcase value in your outreach mess reach messages as well as on your LinkedIn profile, because you have to remember we are not operating in a vacuum. In email, yeah, what you see is what you get. But on LinkedIn, it's really easy to click over the profile and see what else you've got and see if there's anything in it for me. Now let's go back to our gal that didn't beat around the bush and was straight on sales. If I actually click on her profile, she's got some very basic information and says, you know, I'm here for sales. That's what I do. I don't, I don't add resources. I don't add tips. And she is not actually posting very often at all. So if I'm looking at this and saying, you know, I've thought about having sales. It's not something I do right now, but maybe I should make a connection to think about it later. 
um, there's nothing that she's going to offer value for me. She's going to try and sell me and that's it. Um, so there's not very much value to it from my perspective, looking at her note or her profile. On the flip side, I got this note and this girl was a little bit more creative, talked about like actually going out and seeing people. Um, now, I'm not really sure what she wants from me, um, but she's got some interesting skills. And when I click over to her profile, I see she has an elaborate profile. She's got webinars, she's got video recordings, lots of resources on her profile, as well as the fact that she updates things regularly. So I could continue to learn from her. And so this is something I am much more inclined to accept and see where it goes because there is a potential of a relationship or more information. That extra information and that type of social media posting is part of a follow-up, which is the last tenant of one of the reasons that sales efforts fail. Now, going back to statistics, it shows that it takes five different types of outreach to make a sale. And in this case, we're talking about direct outreach. It is phone calls, it is emails, it is LinkedIn messages. Um, when you get into marketing and social media, that goes higher. But I also want to, so let me make the point one, follow-up is really important. And having an active LinkedIn profile that you are sharing valuable information on the regular can help with that follow-up because sales may not happen immediately but if you can show value over the long term, you can start to build that relationship and it can turn into sales down the road. I also want to make the note that just because I'm telling you to send five emails does not mean all emails are equal because you have probably gotten follow up emails very much like the ones on the screen. Now, the first one, if you have a subject line that says, my apologies, and you start out with the line, I don't want to keep bothering you with emails. My internal dialogue says, well, then stop bothering me. Don't send me annoying emails. Don't ever respond from a negative or start out and reach out from a negative. That just that already puts a weird feeling and vibe on it. But again, by saying, I don't want to bother you again, you're being annoying, but you're also not offering me any value. I also get a lot of them like the one on the right that says, hey, I just wanted to make sure you had a chance to see my email and didn't get lost in your inbox. Other variations are floating this to the top of your inbox or, you know, just double check, just checking in. Those are five emails, but that does not mean they are five valuable emails that they're going to bring sales in any longer. So in what's happened with a lot of these sales advice is they're in a webinar and they say, oh, I have to send five emails. And so they do, but they're not five good emails. So what I'm going to do instead of just giving you points is I'm going to actually walk you through a case study that I did for selling a socialite service uh, using LinkedIn Sales Navigator to see what some of the analytics and the results would look like if this was done qualifying leads first and taking more of an intentional approach to it. Now you can see some numbers on here and yes, you can see $7,600 of revenue. That's cool. It's not going to light anything on fire and it's not necessarily the growth you want, but for a case study, it was sales and I thought it was a good thing. So we're going to dive deeper into the numbers a little as we go further, but you can see already they are vastly different from those one and 2% conversions that we saw on that outreach slide. So let me walk you through the strategy I had because I, like I said, I didn't want to reach out to 2,500 people before I got a sale. So my approach was to do this relationship-based marketing. I should say, as if it's not clear, I'm a marketing gal, not a sales gal. And so I don't like feeling like I'm shoving anything down somebody's throats. I will want to do more relationship-based marketing, work with that whole idea of people like buy from those they know, like, and trust. And so my thought was instead of just buying a list and sending out a bunch of emails that I would find my targets on LinkedIn and I would send a message out 
as a soft sell, but still making it fairly clear that I was there to sell something. And so I would give people the option to accept or ignore. And if they ignored, then I'm not going to bother them again. But if they have accepted, that tells me they're open to at least hearing what I have to say. And I have a little bit of a warmer opening. So I started with that. Once they accepted that, I then took their email and I switched it over to an automated series. And what I mean by an automated series is I have seven emails that have been timed out to go every week or so. So it delivers over a period of about two months and it continues to touch. Now, why I use automation is because most of us do not have the time or the inclination to send thousands of people five different emails, right? We've got other things to do with our day. Plus, we may not have skin thick enough to continue to keep following up without any response. When you use an automated system, it doesn't worry about, you know, ooh, am I bothering people? It just sends. It stays on that schedule. Now, for this effort, I used um, ConvertKit, but you can use MailChimp, you can use Vertical Response, whatever your email provider is, almost all of them have an automated email series. So it's really easy to set up. After they went through my seven emails, I rolled them into my newsletter. Now, I happen to send out weekly tips to um, aimed at small business owners every week. So that's an easy thing for me to do. I already have communications that go in. And I have a history of having people sit on my newsletter list for a year or two before they buy from me. So I'm actually okay making this a longer sales game and doing the ongoing outreach. So this may or may not fit your strategy, but this was kind of my approach saying, I'm going to take a really soft approach and I'm going to work it as a long game. So I started out and I said, okay, I want to sell to small business owners. I want to sell social aid support package. We have a very basic monthly package. It's a low cost. We keep all the things from a website running along and give people a couple hours to do whatever they want with it. Okay, so that is meant for new business owners, people that don't have a huge support staff. So when I thought about who I really wanted to sell to, I said, I want women business owners. I want either solo people or ones that have two to three, maybe up to 10 people in their business, because if they're much bigger than that, chances are they already have the support structure that can take care of some of these things for me. I'm not looking for people that are fresh out of college because they may not have the money to earn me. So really, I am looking for people that are experienced in their profession. They know what they're doing, but the fact of running a business is still fairly new to them, and they may have limited experience with things like websites or marketing. And while my country, my my clients are all over the country, I happen to be in the D.C. area, so I said, I'm going to target people in Maryland, D.C., or Virginia, because that's an easy region, and I'm considered local and all of that. So that's my profile. Right. I took that information and then I went over to LinkedIn Sales Navigator and I said, OK, here are the different filters that I'm going to use. They don't all work perfectly. For instance, you'll see there's nothing about gender on LinkedIn Sales Navigator. So if I want to do gender, I'm going to have to eyeball it and choose who I actually reach out to. But I can choose things that are self-employed. I can choose their time in the company. And if you see over in the right-hand column, there are actually some red, the red little bubbles because there are some uh, filters that LinkedIn says, okay, well, do you want to include or exclude people in the marketing industry? And I don't need to sell to other marketers because they already know what I'm trying to, to do. So I'm going to exclude them into my list. Now, the nice thing about this, you can save this search so you can come back to it. And as you're going through, you can keep kind of filtering out and saying, okay, I, I don't need to work with this type of person or I want to change some other things in there. So you see, I'm not using all of the different filters. I'm choosing what's important for me in my profile. So once I do this, LinkedIn gives me something like 7,500 people, which is a huge list to qualify for. So there's plenty of sales opportunities in for me. But if you recall, one of our qualification processes was to check our filters and make sure they are actually a match. 
Because when I look at the list, I see this lovely lady that has actual shows experience of eight years and four months in the role. And I say, well, hmm, I actually ask for people under three years. So what's going on here? So if I click on her profile, I can see that she does, in fact, have, um, have some experience that she has a new company that's only been running for four years, but she's also got a couple of other things going. She's been a business owner in another enterprise for more than 10 years. And so chances are she already has the support structure that I'm trying to provide, which means she's not a great lead for me. Technically, she meets the criteria, but she's not something that somebody that I'm going to pursue. So I'm going to exclude her from my outreach. On the flip side, I find Lisa here, who is a manager at Petco and has a side, whether it's a side hustle or her own thing, she's got a business that she's been going in for two years. This looks great for me because she's she knows how to run a business. But again, those little things like websites may not be for her. Now, as a bonus on here, her profile happens to say she's a dog and a horse lover. And as I spend my weekends on a horse and have two dogs snoring under my desk as I'm speaking to you, this is a fabulous fact for me to know. And it is a way that I could actually personalize my connection if I chose to. That's what it means to personalize. Say, hey, you love, you're love you a horse person. I'm a horse person. Let's hook up. That's personalization, not just throwing a name in. One of the things that I do want to point out is our friend Lisa here does actually list contact information on her profile. Now, some people on LinkedIn will make their contact information available to everybody. So if I really wanted to be sneaky, I could just go through and grab contact information, put it in the automated series and let that go without bothering to reach out. However, I said I wanted to do this as a softer sell, and I wanted to let them qualify them. So even though I could grab her email, I am still going to go through the process of sending her an invitation, asking her to connect, and then I'll grab her email down the road after, if and when she does connect. So I told you earlier that I actually send the same message to everybody, that even though in this case, I'll put a note in about being a horse lover, um, as a whole, I write it so it is... Um, it's standard, but it applies to everybody. Now, as a note, LinkedIn gives you a whopping 300 characters in the notes to connect, which means you have two to three sentences that you can put in to do this. I will tell you, this is probably your hardest piece of the sales process because it's really hard to figure out how to show your value how to show your value, be personal, be interesting, and give people enough to connect with you in 300 characters. So this may take some trial and error a little bit, but think through while that what the value is. As you see, um, my approach is I say I'm reaching out from one business owner to another to talk about your website because I see so many people get tripped up by technology and I want to offer myself as a resource potentially to provide support or just via the tips I put out on LinkedIn. Now, I've tried to make it clear enough that I, I do have something to sell to you, and but I'm not going to shove it down your throat. So, And I do have other things to offer. Now, assuming our friend Lisa or any of these other prospects take us up on this, then what happens next is I do grab their email address and I switch over to my personal email address. The reason I do this is twofold. One, people use LinkedIn very sporadically um, and they're much more likely to check their email um, more often than their LinkedIn messages. But it also means I can move over to that automated series. So the first one that I send comes to my email address. Again, I, um, I kind of talk through my message of why I'm reaching out and that I'd like to talk on technology. And then I end by saying, if nothing else, I'll extend an invitation to ask me any questions you have about technology as it relates to your business. And I say no strings attached. Now, one of the things that is a fallacy about sales is that you always have to close. You always have to do a hard close and you have to be pushy about it. I will tell you, one of my clients is a sales trainer and his premise is teaching salespeople to have real conversations, to have a relationship, to understand what somebody might need 
before they try and sell a service to meet their needs. So I have chosen to take a very soft approach, make it more of a relationship. And quite frankly, the truth is, I really do see so many entrepreneurs that struggle with understanding the language or the lingo. And so they're not getting what they want out of their web development efforts. And unfortunately, sometimes they get screwed because they just don't know what to ask. So I'm willing to actually give anybody 30 minutes to talk about what might be helpful because karma pays it all forward. And I'm good with that. If you're going to do a soft sell, you have to be good with that too. You can't just say, hey, I want a relationship, but then not really do a relationship. That's not going to bring a ton of value. You have to be willing to actually put that in. So um, I will also tell you that even though we have the statistics about five emails, lots of different touches, the vast majority of people that have, res that have responded to me in my efforts actually do those on those first two contacts. I actually um, brought up Sales Navigator. Again, I reactivated it on Thursday to get the screenshots for this deck. And I thought, well, hey, I'm already in there. What, what the heck? I'll reach out to 25 different people. By the next day, I already had eight acceptances. One said, um, I'm on vacation right now, but I'd really like to schedule some time with you when I come back. And the other said, you know, I really had been thinking about doing my uh, website redesign. Can we talk about that? Do you do that too? And I, I sure do. So I'm using a system that I already had set up. So it only took me about half hour to reactivate and that's two solid leads. So when you're doing this well and intentionally, those are vastly different results than needing 2,500 people to reach out to, to get a sale. Right. Um, so now we're in the process that I'm bring, I am bringing them over to my automated series. And I forgot to mention that if you are frantically trying to read every word on the screen or screenshot any of that, you are certainly welcome to. Um, but I will give you a method to um, to grab the deck when we're finished in case it's helpful for you to go back and refer to it. But what the screenshot is now is this is the setup of my automated series in ConvertKit. And I told you I have seven, a series of seven emails that go out. And unlike just sending out the, hey, following up, loading this to the, the top of your inbox, I actually have all kinds of different subject lines and I talk about the value in lots of different ways. And so in this case, you know, if you have ever tried to update something on your website only to have something weird happen or it disappear, you might be able to relate to that. And that experience might make you more open to having some help. That's what I'm trying to do is showcase the different reasons rather than just buy, 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 buy. I'm trying to show value. Now, let's talk through results because I, in a month, when I did this case study, I reached out to, I made 408 invitations and 358 accepted, which is an 88% conversion rate on my first basic point. That is a vastly different number than that 2,500 that we were talking about. So when they, you take the time to qualify and be intentional, you're going to get a lot bigger results. In terms of actual success and moving things forward, I had 21 conversations with them, and I'm going to tell you, some of them were really fun, and um, that turned into three clients, two of which are still actively with me and continuing to develop revenue. They have also created um, introductions for me, and they have included me on other RFPs, so there is more of a potential for revenue. Even if you're saying, huh, that's nice, but 7,600, eh, that's not the growth numbers I want. Correct, but remember, I did this for a month. If we annualized it and averaged out these results, we'd be looking at $90,000, which is a much better growth rate than you have. Plus the fact I still have possibilities out there. I had 258 people go through my email series. Now, some of those dropped off, but like the 21 people that I had conversations with, I took them out of that series because they don't need to keep getting my follow-ups if I'm already in conversations with them. Now, this was back in August, and I still have more than 200 people that are sitting on my list. And if you remember, I said it has happened many times that I've had people sit on my list for a couple of years. And when the timing is right or when they finally have budget, they reach out. 
So I am looking at this as a long game and I'm willing to bet there's probably more revenue coming from it. Now, these were also my numbers on a very small batch, but I know that Bobby has also done some, um, some outreach on Sales Navigator with very targeted audiences. And I think she said something like she had 60% conversion rates on some of those things. Yeah, and actually... Um... I think this is really an excellent point. When you are targeting groups, uh, I'm doing this on behalf of Innovation Women. And one of the things that we're doing is specifically targeting event managers who come and use the Innovation Women platform for free. So some of our stuff is not a sales oriented thing, but what it's doing is supplying people who come to the Innovation Women website and use it. So they are customers of a sort. Um, we had, we were targeting people that were inside tech companies. We were targeting people who worked or volunteered with an employee resource group or an ERG. We were targeting people who are inside corporations who are doing diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so if we start looking at these different groups, what we were getting was one group had 15% response in terms of that initial acceptance. Another group had 41% acceptance. Another group had 58% acceptance. And so by keeping track and uh, looking at our numbers over time, you know, we could see the acceptance rates and know which group to target more fully. And then when we were going a little bit further, that was just the acceptance of the connection. We were also looking at replies and we were looking at responses and we were looking at the most important thing, which was a booked meeting. So back over to you, Nicole. Thank you. No, but I think that raises a great point too, not only on the targeting being so important, but the fact that once this, I mentioned this is a system that you can use, but the first time that you're doing it, it is definitely worth looking at those analytics and those numbers, especially even when you get to emails, because maybe you send your seven emails, but hey, you see a lot of drop off on email number four, your click rates down, your open rates down, or maybe people actually unsubscribe. That tells you something is not quite right with email four and you need to change it up a little bit. But I will say having this done systematically, like I said, I turned this back on on Thursday and it took me a half hour as opposed to, you know, going and sending all my follow ups and collecting everything. So this can be a fairly efficient way to create some possibilities for you, let's say. So there is some effort to set up. But if you are wondering where you get started, this is your homework. This is how you get ready. First and foremost, go on to LinkedIn and take a good hard look at your profile like a stranger was. Is there value there? Do people understand what you do? And do you even seem friendly and approachable in that? Um, and maybe if you're not sure about that, you ask somebody else to go to your profile and Ask them to tell you what kind of impression they would get from it. You want, you know, be willing to take some tough love on this and get somebody that's honest for you. But that's going to make a difference in some of the connections. If you are not already posting on LinkedIn, then start. That does not mean you need to be on LinkedIn all day, every day. That does not mean you even need to post something every day. Start with thinking about, can I post something once a week? Um, that gets my profile going. It gets me the ability to continue to stay out in front of people so that I have that long-term value. And I'm not worried. And, you know, I don't say, oh, I didn't get any sales this month. Okay, let's pull that out and see if we can make that a longer sales cycles. Because for many of us, you might have, you know, especially for big projects, you might have three month, eight month sales cycles. So being for somebody to see your name and valuable information on the regular really helps move that relationship along and establish that trust with you. Next up, understand your value. 
And because I talked about sending all kinds of different angles of the value to my email or to my email list in my series, but think about what your customers really value from them. And I'd even encourage you to ask them because we all have the, the benefits to our services that you probably did when you were setting up your marketing language. Uh, but the thing that my clients tell me over and over is that they like working with me because I deliver things on time and I stay on budget. And to me, that's like the lowest common denominator of service. It's not something I would have ever thought about, but to my clients, the fact that I'm reliable is huge. And so one of my seven emails, the subject line is actually, we do what we say we'll do. Uh, and so think about the value, of, if I'm going to say outside the box, what actually matters to your client, because that will help you develop your messaging. From there, create your list of profiles and take that over and take advantage of your free month on LinkedIn. Take that for a spin and see what kind of possibilities come up from you. Now, if this was helpful, I told you, you are more than welcome to get the deck. Go to socialite.net forward slash Linus, pop your email in, I'll send you the deck. And then I will also take the liberty of including you in the tips that I send out on a weekly basis. You don't want them, no big deal. There's an easy unsubscribe button. But if you also want to talk to me directly, you have more questions, um, this is my info, but I believe we have maybe 12 or 13 minutes that we are able to take some questions right now. So, And we have many questions. All right, fire away. <laughs> we have many questions. And actually, if you have a question, definitely drop it into the Q&A. So I think we have a number of people who have basically asked some variation of the same question, which is talking about email opt-ins. I mean, we're all can span compliant here. Um, so, you know, like how did you manage the email opt-ins in LinkedIn? Did you share a link? Did you request their email address? Um, when you were starting that email operation before you put them into your newsletter? Did you need to get their permission? And what did you say kind of in each part of that automated series about permissions? Got it. Um, and there's a couple, there's like some variations on this. So let's just talk overall about the email. Okay. So uh, let's go back and we'll, yeah. we'll go back a little bit here. So if we are going to follow can spam by the letter of the law, then what we have, we would actually say, hey, I'd like to include you in your email. Is that okay? Can you physically opt in? Um, most people don't actually do that. Uh, and so, but the one of the big components of can spam is making sure that you get you give people the option to opt out. So I will tell you a couple of things that I do. First off, um, on collecting the email addresses. Most people, once you make the connection with them, then your email address becomes available to you as part of their profile image. It's, it's under the contact information if you didn't know, I think, let's see if I have this on. Um, so usually what you would do is once your connection is like these little dots here, if you click, if it was live, you clicked on it, there would be a drop down and it would be contact information and you can actually pull the email address out of that. So. What I did is I actually took this and the first message, this one right here, this is from my email address. It's not a, it's not a spam um, or excuse me, it's not a system. It's not I'm like I am physically sending each and every one to them. I have replies. Um, somebody wrote me a, a note back this morning and she said, hey, I really like your message and your approach. Um, I'll reach out if I have questions. OK, so I took that as potential, but she doesn't want to keep hearing from me anymore. So she is not going into my convert kit. She is not going to go into my automated series. So I'm being mindful of that because I also write, I also have people write me back on LinkedIn before we get to this that says, um, thanks for, you know, thanks for reaching out. Um, I'll, you know, I'll keep you in mind if you're like, to me, that's already a conversation. Like they, they've responded as they are. I'm not going to keep bothering them to that. However, once you get into the email series, um, the big thing, if you are using an email marketing system, you must give them the ability to opt out. Now, I will tell you outside of even just the sales efforts, I have a lot of clients that come to me and they say, hey, I have a list from X and X you know, ago. And while I don't technically have their permission right now, I want to let them see what we're, what we're doing there. 
So what we usually do is we send a message saying, hey, I'm in a new effort, um, you know, and so I'd like to be able to send you emails. But if this isn't up your alley, he, you know, jump off this list right now. Make it very easy to get can spam. So this one is going to go to an opt-in. The one I will, I will tell you, I get a lot of sales messages that say, reply to me if you don't want to me, to hear from me again. Technically, that's compliant. However, I have some people that respect it and other people that seem to use that as, oh, I replied and I validated my email. And so that's another kind of, to me, I'm more likely to, to market as spam itself instead of doing that. So um, I hate to tell you that I am doing the spirit, if not the true letter of the law, um, but that is my approach to that, not just on sales outreach, but effort. If you want to be, if the true late letter of the law, um, then you can do this is group emails through your own unique things, or you can ask for an opt-in. Okay. Um, and we did have one question that somebody was saying that sociallight.net um, backslash lioness wasn't working. I just tried it. Um, I will fully admit that my muscle memory took over when I first typed it in. I did sociallight.com. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> so People, that might be the only one. Yeah, so that might be other people's issue. So. Um, it, it's working for me. Yep. Just for me too. I will pop it into the chat to see if that well, if that yeah, I just did that. So awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping that was might have been the other person's problem as well. But <laughs> I told I was like, gosh darn it, it's not working. <laughs> All right. So we have more questions. All right, fire um, away. Is your newsletter monthly? Um, so I actually, the way my newsletter works out, um, I have several options and, um, if it's your on email, um, so if you only want to hear from me quarterly, you can do that. Right. But I send this email out. I got in the habit, like two years ago, I decided I was going to be a good marketer and email more often. And so I started, I send every Sunday morning, I send a quick tip out. Um, and it's, you know, a couple paragraphs and some people seem to really like it because they act me out. So that is my default. But if that is too much, um, you have the option to hear from me monthly or just, you know, when I send out events like this. Um, that is the way my email works. It's another form of targeting um, and it's a way to not do that. But that's um, that's my stick. OK, the question was for success or just because you don't want to hear from me every week. But... OK, our next question is, how would this work if you are targeting people dealing with such something that's less tangible, like burnout? How would you filter for those people? Um, I would start thinking about things that what are likely to be the high pressure jobs, um, CEO, you know, and that would, you know, even in some things like using a job title like CEO or founder, somebody that's a, you know, the, the C-suite, the executives, um, you would probably want to look for um, people that are higher along in their career, right? Now there's, that's obviously a vast, that's a stereotype, so to speak, because you can burn out at any time. But I, that's where I would go back to say, okay, for your clients or your people, who are they? Look at those characteristics. There is a, on LinkedIn, like it's a new, I have not played with it much. Um, yeah. There is a something about um, activities and shared experiences and keywords in articles. This is the type of things that I'm thinking. So you can actually kind of get, this is some of the things like Twitter advertising used to do, is that you could say, okay, what are they talking about? Look at those keywords that they're advertising. So I honestly have not played with that part of it, um, but you could actually do a search on burnout and see if people are talking about it and then target that type of people. Okay. Sounds, sounds like a plan. Um, where are my Q and A's? Here they are. Okay. Um, what platform do you use to send out the emails? Is our um, next question. That one, I happen to use ConvertKit. Uh, okay. That, I, I found that to be easy for the serials, but um, like I said, um, I've done similar things in MailChimp and, and all of that. So any of them should work. Got it. Uh, 
Judy's asking, notice you are messaging within Sales Navigator. What's your thoughts on how to keep a message paper trail history if you stop using Sales Navigator? You know, it's interesting. I actually switched that myself because I don't do this often. Like I don't do this often enough that my Sales Navigator goes away. So in the Sales Navigator, where am I? Um, thing. Um, there is a, like there is in there, one of their drop down menus, they have the option to, like, so uh, you'd have to click on the profile. Come on, buddy. Um, and then like, again, in this option, it gives you the, um, one of the choices is view on LinkedIn proper. Um, so you can just switch over to LinkedIn, make them like, make the connection request that way. So then it stays in your full LinkedIn, as opposed to your sales navigator box going away. It's an extra step, but I, especially if you're going to kind of come in and out, that might be an easier way to keep track of the conversation. Got it. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Do you find that doing email campaign out of Wix is as effective as MailChimp? Um, no, uh, <laughs> I will. I will tell you, I'm, I don't use Wix very Like I have a couple of clients that use Wix. I don't use their emails a lot, but in my experience is that when you have a Wix that is, you know, they are there for websites and then they add on the extra services, the extra services are often lacking as opposed to the, uh, the services that are dedicated email services. Um, and so I don't think they're, um, I don't find Wix terribly user-friendly to begin with. Um, but I think that's, that's some of the things that um, you get a little bit more guidance. MailChimp also has these automations, these kind of guidance, uh, you know, kind of guided suggestions and steps and better resources. So you probably can, um, but I find some of the other platforms a little bit more powerful. Okay. We do have a request to um, show your last slide, the one with the five steps while we're asking our next question. So there we go. All right. Uh, in addition to Sales Navigator, do you use the paid version of LinkedIn? So you have to use like Sales Navigator is part of the paid version of LinkedIn. Um, and so you get a free month of it and you get, you know, sales to me, Sales Navigator is the big thing. Now you get um, with the different levels of subscriptions, you get like 10 in mails, 50 in mails, which means that you have the ability to just, I want to send Bobby a note, right? That without connecting to her, I just want to send her a cold sales note. That's not my strategy. So I don't really care how many in mails they give me. I'm really just looking for the list building things. I mean, it, sometimes there are nice things, right? Because when you get um, LinkedIn premium, you also get LinkedIn learning, which is used to be, I think lynda.com is, is where it is. And so there's actually some interesting courses there. So there can be benefits to go with it. Um, but I actually was having a conversation about this with one of my clients earlier, um, that to me, it's just, I'm looking for the list building facility, uh, functionality, like the other bells and whistles of LinkedIn, uh, premium don't excite me. Okay. Um, question from Lisa, when you're checking the stats on the emails in your series, are you looking at open rates or click-through rates on anything clickable in your mail? Um, I'm looking at all, more than anything, I'm looking at open rates because if I don't get an open rate, then I don't get any opportunity to do this. Now, if, uh, sorry, whoever was, was asking the slide, Lisa. I'm going to move, um, I'm going to move back. <laughs> um, like you can see, I do have, um, a check out the details and I have an opt out, but most of this is not actually clicked in. Like I, one of my emails, instead of saying, you know, click on the link, it says it gives my phone number and it says call me. So these emails are not terribly um, click heavy on a true marketing campaign. I look at click rate, um, but really what I, I'm more interested in having them hit the reply button to me is more because nobody's going to actually just sign up by getting this email, right? Like they might look at the package online, but they're always going to have a conversation with me first. So I'm much more interested in the replies than the actual click through rate. Yep. And we are getting to the end of our time together today, folks. Um, I just want to make sure that uh, everybody has, understands we are going to be sending out a recording and you can also reach out to uh, Nicole on the link. I think the suggestion was to use Chrome instead of other uh, nav uh, browsers, just in terms of making sure that that, uh, that works for you. And uh, we do have like 
I'm going to say two questions left. Maybe we can answer them quickly. Let's try. So, all right. The first one is, what are your suggestions for follow-up angles when people have replied to you expressing interest, maybe even met, but have not yet committed to a sale? So that's where that's where you actually do start getting personalized. Personalized. If you've had a conversation, then it goes a little bit more to the type of thing that says, "Hey, I just read this article and I thought of you, and so I thought I'd pass it on." Or, you know, I I am definitely guilty of I'm cleaning out my inbox and I saw this old email from you and I realized that we we had lost touch and we never you know had a plan. So I just thought I'd you know touch base and see what you're thinking. Um, I like that. That's, I guess, kind of could be a floating to the top of your inbox, but I was, you know, basically pick your poison of, I was thinking of you and thought I'd reach out. <laughs> All right. Last question for the day. Can you, uh, can you speak to the use of a company page on LinkedIn? Do you maintain one? Um, I, I have one. Okay. So my strategy and most of my clients with this is that you need to have one. It is a valid, it is a validation checker. It shows up in Google search a lot. And when somebody's just trying to check out your company, it needs to have it. I am not as excited about posting on it regularly and keeping an update because LinkedIn is driven by personal news feeds. And so really the only time that you're going to see stuff come through um, the news feed with a company page is on ads. And if you do want to do ads on LinkedIn, you have to do it through a company page. So it's a good idea to have one. Um, I think my Socialites company page is connected to our blog. So if a new blog goes up, like something goes up, but it's not something I actively maintain at all. Got it. All right. Nicole, if I can ask you to go to your last slide so people have your contact information. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Nicole, for very useful. We love useful around here. Uh, detailed presentation today and lots of great ideas for everyone. Absolutely. So thank you all for joining us today and uh, come back and network with us <laughs> next month. Take care. <laughs>